To say more about the trust and about the competition, please join me in welcoming the competition's manager, Don Stastny. Don? Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chase. Uh, the Trust for the National Mall launched the, this competition to find the most beautiful, useful, and sustainable ideas for the mall itself. And as Chase said, it's, it's, we had three different sites that we identified throughout the mall, where if you look at an overall map of the mall, you realize what the impact these three sites have, and also the connectivity, I think, between the sites as to how they will both impact the existing monuments and memorials as well as the um, uh, really identify the spaces in between, if you will. Uh, these three uh, finalists that we're going to present tonight uh, were selected uh, through a process where we first asked for a designer portfolio to establish the design level. We then went through a stage where we surrounded these designers with teams so that we could move the project into implementation. And then the third stage was asking, asking four teams for each site to develop specific designs. Those uh, were exhibited uh, earlier, a few months ago, and the jury made its, its selection and recommendation to the three that you will see tonight. <clears throat> The trust for the National Mall, um, I have to say, is, is almost a miracle in itself. And that here is a organization that is barely four years old that is making such a major impact on the mall itself. The trust is a sponsoring organization for the, for the uh, National Mall Design Competition. And they are also the official nonprofit partner for the National Park Service and are dedicated to restoring and improving the National Mall. I think it's interesting that, about, that nearly half of the nation's population, half of the nation's population will visit the, the mall at some point within their lifetime. It truly is uh, an indication and symbolic of our nation, of what we believe in, and what our values are. We want to thank very much the National Building Museum, Chase, uh, for hosting this and also working with the um, National Capital Planning Commission for this particular uh, event tonight. Throughout this competition, we have been joined with a steering committee made up of different um, uh, groups throughout the nation's capital. And the steering committee has been very uh, instrumental in getting us to this particular point. They are continuing to be a resource for us and advocates for the overall competition. With that, I would like to introduce to you tonight the moderator of tonight's discussion, Mr. John Beardsley. He is the director of the Garden and Landscape Studies at Dumbarton Oaks here in Washington, and is an adjunct professor of landscape architecture at Harvard's Graduate School of Design. John, please. Thank you, Don, and thanks to all of you for coming out on what must be one of the most beautiful evenings of the year. Um, I want to thank the uh, Trust for the National Mall for organizing this event with the, uh, with the National Capital Planning Commission and the National Building Museum. I also want to acknowledge the incredible work that, that the Trust has done in organizing the competition. Uh, and I want to say that I'm honored to be here as an, as an individual deeply interested in the future of the mall. Think of me as John Q. Public, who cares about public space. Uh, I'm also delighted to be here as a representative of, of Dumbarton Oaks. We're one of the few places in the world with a research program in the history of gardens, landscape architecture, and the cultural landscape more largely. In some ways, our programs are complementary to those of the National Building Museum. We focus on, uh, on the design landscape. They focus more on, well, buildings, although buildings in connection to landscape. Uh, so I'm happy to collaborate with the Building Museum across town and, and across disciplines. I um, am charged with uh, 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 maintaining the protocol for the evening. And I just want to mention that uh, we'll, we'll be having three presentations. First, site Constitution Gardens. Secondly, the Washington Monument Grounds at Sylvan Theater. And third, Union Square. Uh, each 
uh, team will have about 10 minutes to introduce their project. Um, if we have a little time, there might be a follow-up question from me. Uh, at the end of the three presentations, we'll have a brief discussion uh, where I'll engage uh, the members of all three teams. Uh, and then we'll have a period of questions from the audience. And uh, we are asking you to write those questions on the cards that you were given when you entered. And at a certain point, I'll ask you to hold them up and they'll be collected and delivered to me. So um, without further ado, I'd like to get started. Uh, and uh, our first presenters are Adam Greenspan with PWP Landscape Architecture and Robert Rogers with Rogers Marble Architects uh, to talk about their proposal for Constitution Gardens. Go ahead. Thank you, John. So I'm Adam Greenspan with Peter Walker and Partners, and we are the scheme that liked something about Constitution Gardens. That said, both Peter Walker and I uh, have been coming to Washington, D.C. and the National Mall for 20 and 60 years, respectively, uh, and neither of us knew Constitution Gardens by name. Um, if you look up at the mall. Uh, this, <laughs> in the light, you can't see the outline, but this is Constitution Gardens here. The Vietnam Memorial is here, uh, World War II Memorial here, and the reflecting pool here. And what struck us initially was the contrast that Constitution Gardens had to the formality and the linearity of the rest of the mall. Um, it, this is an image from inside. Uh, the clean lines and the sort of uh, irregular planting and the l amount of planting were the things that struck, out, struck us uh, as important um, and special about this place, even though there were a number of things that um, were less than attractive. The gardens today is dying. There are th plantings that were done years ago and replaced that have since died. The soil uh, has slumped in various places and the edge of the pond uh, is um, falling apart. But when you look back at the initial uh, construction image that I'm showing on the left, um, you see a clear connection between that and this Brill Marx image, um, focusing on a clearness and a clarity of design uh, and a biomorphic modernism, um, which was the design goals of, the, of that piece. What you also see in the lower right um, is sort of that deterioration, but within that, uh, the edge of the pond uh, remains a clear line and remains something that is an orienting aspect uh, within this alternate reality. Um, and what we really liked was that it was an alternate reality, or it should be. There's a level of uh, separation from the streets and from the rest of the mall that you feel here that you don't feel uh, in any other place on the mall. And it had the potential to integrate um, both living systems and social systems, uh, integrate um, crisp uh, aesthetic design with um, process-based uh, experiences. When we looked at it, we wanted to heighten those original intentions uh, of clarity um, and of optimism, but also um, really highlight uh, and enhance the potential for variety uh, and separation. And the way that we did that was to focus on the section. Um, right now, the existing line of the ground is here at that change in those two uh, shades. And so when you're inside the garden, you can see the traffic and hear the traffic passing uh, outside on Constitution Avenue. Um, so the, the uh, ensconced feeling that you really should be getting is something that you don't get because of the activity going on around you. At the same time, when we had uh, some of our specialist consultants look at um, test soil tests as well as the tree quality there, what we found was that the soil, um, and also looking through historical documents, the soil was a series of fill um, deposits. So that soil had slumped and sunk uh, in different degrees um, over time. And the trees there, uh, the existing trees on the site, um, were all failing. Hundreds of trees had died over the uh, time that Constitution has, Gardens has been here since 1976. Um, and many had been replaced, but many still died. And so um, our proposal sits 
uh, on the basis of needing to regenerate and rebuild the soil in Constitution Gardens. And by doing that, we also um, are remaking uh, and creating a new place. Contaminated soil that we can get from the site um, can serve as fill to bring the grade up probably about eight feet from what it is today uh, around the edges of the site. So in these areas um, right now, uh, it's almost flush with the adjacent sidewalk. These knolls will grow by eight feet, creating a separation but also clear entries between those knolls into uh, the gardens. Similarly, uh, we're talking about raising uh, the elevation here and also creating a threshold um, with an architectural pavilion that Rob will talk about shortly. Um, but that gives a presence on the street um, as well as, this is 17th Street, a separation from the rest of the mall. So what we're creating is a self-contained um, integration of uh, plant life, animal life, uh, as well as activities for people. In doing that, we're aiming to connect it to the city in various ways, and one of those ways is through the water cycle. We're looking at taking water that comes from the adjacent buildings, either that's pumped from their uh, bathtubs below grade um, or off the roofs, and using that um, to fill the pond, um, which then would be used as irrigation uh, in the landscape. We're also looking at the landscape that we're installing to filter and clean the runoff, which will now be coming down those heightened slopes, um, and then reusing that water. Um, finally, like the uh, tidal basin right now is being used to fill the reflecting pool, and that's in construction today, um, that same tidal basin water is proposed to be used to flush out the system uh, in the lake over time. And so what we get is an integrated topography um, a varied horticultural display um, and ecological uh, situations. Some of those areas will be lawns. The majority of them will be lawns and meadows, um, which highlight the existing uh, dominant scheme. And then we have uh, upland and lowland gardens, uh, as well as a continuous aquatic shelf where wetland plants can be planted below the edge, so we're still highlighting this undulating edge of the lake, um, and those wetland plants will filter runoff uh, and also filter the pond water. <clears throat> so together this is intended to make an aesthetic ecology, not just something that works for the landscape and the environment, but something that also maintains the original design intent um, of clar clarity and crispness. So <clears throat> our upland and lowland gardens are, con are composed of a series of plantings that will each bloom at different seasons and at different heights. So that clear sweeps of color um, will show around the pond as well as the uh, continuous aquatic edge uh, at the water level. What we're also proposing is that the existing trees that are healthy, um, because there are certain trees that are healthy, uh, those that could withstand the kinds of inundated and uh, saturated soils that they're in, be reused. Um, and so in order to enhance the enclosure around the edge, we're proposing a, a, a forest or, or a woodland made of those existing trees. So as trees are harvested from the existing site, certain areas could be uh, phased in construction so that we begin to create this topography and then create this wooded edge. At the same time, the largest trees, specimen trees, that could be moved and that are healthy on site would provide uh, sculpture and shadow uh, or sculptural qualities and shadow in the open lawns. This is an image that describes the ground plane showing the areas of lawn and meadow, the knoll here between the Vietnam War Memorial and uh, Constitution Gardens has been increased significantly to provide a buffer between those things and add to this uh, enclosed uh, feel. But the planting on all areas maintains these lines and highlights the uh, existing um, curves in, of, of the site. This is the plan here, and what's shown at this end on 17th in front of the new pavilion is a circle in the water. This space is a reflecting pool. Uh, when it's full, you would only read a thin line in the water's surface or just under the water's surface because the water would be continuous across it. But we imagine this as a separate basin, something that can be drained separately from the rest of the pool. 
so that this could become something where children can walk on a path around, use toy boats uh, and model sailboats in that open space like they do in France and in Central Park. Or this area could be frozen over to become a skating rink in the uh, winter. That said, the scale of this is very big. A hockey rink could fit there. So this is more like skating on a real uh, lake than it is in something like a, an, an urban uh, skating rink in the middle of a plaza. Lastly, the existing 56 Signers Memorial um, is another place that we never knew about. And what we want to do is highlight that island, make the movement from the solid land across the water and onto the island something that really goes through uh, two threshold experiences where you feel that you're walking over water and end up in some place special. Uh, to do that, we're enhancing the edge with added wetland planting, added uh, willows, and then packing that island full of magnolias. This is an image of the skating rink in winter, looking at the scale and looking at the lighting design that we have, really proposing that this is a place for day and night activity. And then this is an image at the far western end the Vietnam Memorial is further off to the left, where we've made flatter areas in front of the sloped areas so that you come in through the threshold openings, but have areas that can be flexible and used for various uses. This is an image looking back uh, at 17th and the pavilion there, an upland garden, lowland garden, and uh, our outdoor amphitheater. Um, that can be programmed in a variety of ways, either large as shown here, or with smaller performances, um, as well as performances taking place in other areas. Thanks. <laughs> and this, we begin to discuss the, the pavilion itself, which in this image is located at the east end of the lake, um, in the site of, of the original location of the SOM proposal. Um, we decided to keep the building in that location, that it was the right place, the centrality, the symmetry, and the relationship between the lake and the upper landscape areas. But we did two things. We, we brought it closer to the water so that there actually is a sectional and very uh, dynamic engagement between the building and the, and the water. And it also allowed us to clear the pathway to be continuous because since this original proposal for Constitution Gardens, the World War II monument was built, and to develop and enhance that axial relationship we felt was critical to, to that monument's success. So the, the pavilion is, is intended to be a very simple building. We think when you build on the mall, you need to build just enough building. And so it wanted to be a simple thing that you move through and is about circulation and it's simple enough to occupy and be a feature within the landscape and let you focus on the landscape. So it's, it's, it's pulled out to engage the walkway around the lake and you can either move up and into the pavilion on a slight ramp up to gain the vista out of the gardens or you can descend down to the lake through. So it's really a, a threshold moment. And we started with the, the simple box, but then we opened it up to create a perspective of dynamism from all of the areas as you move around the lake. So you're never actually giving it a, a pure location, and it diminishes and increases in size as you move through it. It's relatively simple programmatically, a very large set of stairs that handles crowds that could actually, people can sit in the shade and engage and you can move around. So it's a set of steps that are also intended to be occupied that go from the upper terrace down to the lake passage around. And in that lower level are contained the concession areas, skate rentals, uh, restrooms, service areas for the park service, which means that the upper level is, is very pure clean space. It's either occupancy for uh, observation of the gardens, a moment of respite within the mall, and proposal for a restaurant. And we've chosen a, a simple system of an initially a structural diagrid that actually encloses the pavilion, which has a combination of both enclosure and openness, so that it's actually participatory in the landscape. It, we felt it critical that the building be located in such a way that it's identifiable as a, as a destination, both day and night, when you're coming into the gardens. And 
is also gives you a, a place of location inside, outside, and through. Really this, this threshold moment to begin engaging. The Constitution Gardens is the kind of the, the one place, as Adam was talking about, on the mall, where you remove yourself from all of the other participation and the sort of the big monuments and the other things going around. It really is a, a place of respite and the building is intended to invite you there and enable all those things to go on. And it's, it's critical that we remember that the mall is not just for the 24 million visitors a year but also for the residents of Washington DC. That this is a park space that is part of uh, the work area and living area of all DC. So the the year-round activities, whether it's the dining facilities or the skating on the lake, um, are part of that. And in the end, we felt like the recognition of the original intent of the very clean, clear geometry of the lake also needed resolution of a of a very super clean geometry. That the the when S O M and and Dan Kiley started this. You know, the, this was the place for the optimism and clarity of modernism on the mall. And we felt that within that, it was the, we wanted to respect that, engage it in a timely way, and em embrace the simplicity of the, the empty shell that is not a monument, not a museum, but is a place of measure and mark on, on the gardens themselves. And this last is just sort of, a, scroll through to, to think about the intensity of the section. So we're starting at the, uh, the west end. Um, that was the knoll between Vietnam. And we're actually moving um, back in the year. Uh, or no, actually, we're, we, this was spring and we're moving through the year a bit. So what you'll see is the, these are two of the threshold moments coming off of Constitution Avenue where the small wall and the larger landscaped hills separate and allow for these experiences <clears throat> to happen inside. We're in summer now. The larger open meadows can be maintained as loose program spaces and then many of the paths have been widened and connected so that the movement from Vietnam War Memorial through this site to the rest of the mall um, is really clear and accessible. We also are proposing um, the direct access across uh, from Constitution to World War II as well as a meandering path that might go bridge across 17th Street one day to get to the rest of the mall and to the Washington Monument. But it's, it's part is, is that when you're, when you're in the garden, you're separated from the mall. And it is that moment where all around you, you've been through these highly emotional, highly national, they're historic things. You may be subject to enormous amounts of interpretation and discussion. And Constitution Gardens is a place to actually come in and relax and engage. And, and it literally is the garden within the mall. And so the, the building is there to fulfill that same kind of purpose. It's this place of, of respite, relaxation, and engagement um, as part of the gardens. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for one quick question, uh, which is, I'm intrigued by how respectful you're being of the 60s modernist landscape by SOM and Kylie. And I wonder if we need to be as deferential to a landscape from the 60s as we do to the rest of the mall, which has a much longer history. Do you want that one? Well, I think uh, we, we can, uh, this was debate, you know, that we had, and there were certain requirements uh, related to furnishing and the feel, but there are certain aspects of the design that we really admired. And so the deference um, was both uh, deferential, but also looking for opportunities within that basic scheme, because the diagram was something that both of our firms supported. Yeah, it was very, you know, one of the things that we, discovered when you talk about you know modernizing the mall or bringing it up to date is when I was stunned and I didn't actually look this up until after we won so I can't take credit for thinking of it before but the at the luncheon uh, Caroline Cummings talked about how the mall, the mall saw 24 million dollars a year 24 million visitors a year and then I sort of went home and I did my little census lookup which is you know 
far greater than the population of the United States when the mall was designed. So if you, if you imagine, how do you think forward uh, for a design to become something so much more than you could ever imagine? And I think we saw our role as, as coming in in this generation and, and imagining how can we make the mall work the way it's supposed to and what is it going to be doing in 50 years? And I think that's where we wanted to honor the vision of the original Constitution Gardens. Mm -hmm. I also think there's, there's a bigger difference in what will be built and what we're describing than it might seem when you look at the plan. That the change in verticality of the ground and the change with the planted systems are things that will really change the, the vibe and the feel and make it more than it even was imagined initially. I was playing the devil's advocate because my answer to that question would be yes, we do need to respect <laughs> the 60s as much as we do the 1890s. Um, uh, thank you very much, Adam and Robert. We'll move on now to the Washington Monument grounds at Sylvan Theater and uh, Marianne Weiss with Weiss Manfredi and Skip, Skip Grafham with Olin will uh, join us now. Thank you. <clears throat> It's a little unclear if we know what to do about this scroll that's coming across. <laughs> Magic. That may happen later. That may happen later. <laughs> um, uh, Skip and I are very happy to represent our team, and Michael Manfredi and Hallie Boyce are right behind us. Um, we've had a, a great... Um, <laughs> great opportunity to collaborate together in what we think is one of the most extraordinary sites in the country. And so we have great thanks for the Trust for the National Mall, uh, for the National Building Committee, uh, uh, National Building Museum for hosting this, uh, for NCPC um, Park Service. But uh, to put things in context, the National Mall really is our nation's uh, center stage. And it really is the site of some of the most important acts of communication and communion in our country. And at the heart of this, Invisible for Biles, is the Washington Monument. It is the literal and philosophical compass for our nation. So if we extend from the central landscape, you could say that the Sylvan Theater, which you could see the dream of it with Alice Pike Barney's dancers in her first event in 1917, her dream was to take the Shakespearean vision of a theater and performance to the heart of our nation's capital. So the surprise, of, say, the Shakespearean forest might actually enter this setting. Um, it's a setting that has a great legacy. I think just to add to what Marion's saying, as a landscape architect, it, there's not a, a bigger thrill or an honor to work on what is really the, the most <laughs> preeminent public landscape in the United States. Um, it's really where past, present, and future have come together. It's where you know history has been made, where we protest and discuss current events and where we chart our, hopefully chart our future course. Um, and I think in, in terms of our site in particular, uh, the amount of use that it gets and the amount of uh, interest that it gets, has we, it's paid a price. It's been loved to death. And despite the heroic efforts of the Park Service who never have the funding they need, uh, this, is, this has been the result. I mean, our site in particular is very close to some of the most popular destinations on the mall. And resiliency and uh, flexibility were probably two of the most important components going as we went forward in the design. Now as we started to look at the site, you could say it's a site that's on the edge, literally and figuratively, of the mall. And it's a site that is a theater in many ways. If you're in the audience, your back is to the most incredible symbol of our nation, the Washington Monument. And you could say that our face is looking to a, a proscenium theater, and we're also looking towards now, maybe not envisioned in 1917, the wall of tour buses that find their way to the mall. So this is a very strange, challenged site. And what we thought was so strange, as, as things have turned out, is that the theater really ignored its monumental context. Right at the backdrop is this incredible icon that any performer in any audience would want to see, but not here. And we also realized that this cultural landscape, if you will, is larger than just the mall. And directly to the south of this particular site is the Tidal Basin, the extraordinary landscape that reminds us that this site uh, was at one point all underwater. 
So we wanted to know how we could connect the kind of cultural identity, but also these two very different worlds and landscapes together so that the sense of being an edge site really is more of a center site. Now, the other question was, well, performance is a number of different things, and if this is going to be a high-performance landscape that we would want to be in during the day without a performance, or a place that might be wonderful for 100, 1,000, or 10,000 people, then we had an opportunity to think about this landscape in a new way. And so what we did was we pulled up the land that was falling towards a tidal basin, and by lifting it up, we could actually create a bowl, if you will, with a stage at its center and conveniently conceal all those buses that were never part of Alice uh, Pike Barney's vision for this theater. You could see, though, that the Sylvan, which was at the heart of the, the, the Sylvan theater, was really not very present on this site. And if we start to think about what a Sylvan grove might offer, it really could be a place of magic and mystery. And so you could see that the identity then of this amphitheater that we started to envision that could face the Washington Monument could also be a grove. And it's that grove that could extend and extend south far so that we could actually start to envision not only a canopy extending, but maybe a physical experience connecting these two landscapes. If you will, they're divided by six lanes of traffic now and our experience in Seattle, as you can see below, is really about bridging landscapes that were improbably separated by infrastructure. So together, the idea was to really bring into focus a there, there, a heart to this site, an amphitheater that could open itself and open its arms and vistas to the Washington Monument, but also a wandering bridge that could extend a slow, connective element across to the water and take full advantage, in fact, of the upper tier of the amphitheater so that that becomes the natural route, ADA accessible, down to the tidal basin. Okay, thanks, Brian. I'm going to use the pointer, so this is probably better. So we'll just use the, the site plan to, to orient. Obviously, this is the, the visitor facility, the amphitheater and stage oriented towards the monument, the survey lodge and picnic area, and then this is Independence Avenue here. You may notice a few alterations. We'll talk about those a little bit differently a little bit later. Um, but the idea is that this is what we saw as potentially a final composition. We, the competition site itself was north of Independence Avenue, but we couldn't stay in the lines, as you can imagine. It was just too tempting to go beyond that. So looking at what was really one big space before 1942 when Independence Avenue disconnected the Southern Monument grounds. We really felt that this project, not only from its use as a gateway and a destination, but also from its elevation and relationship to the topography of the monument, was really a chance to reconnect to the Southern Monument grounds, both visually and physically. As Marion described, the bridge coming off the top of the amphitheater, a sinuous curve through a woodland canopy landing down near the tidal basin, uh, we've removed a couple of roads with our traffic engineers. Um, everything's fine. You'll still get to work on time. Um, but the idea of, again, re-engaging Independence Avenue in a way that's much more pedestrian friendly and opens up this area to be really what it once was, which was a, a waterfront and a relationship to the tidal basin. So this, the structure of this came from a couple of places. First and foremost, it's a topographic solution. The idea is that the architecture and the landscape are really integrated. And this was um, Olin's uh, redesign of the, of the monument grounds for security wall. Again, starting from the idea that the, at the monument, obviously, it's all about the mound or the plinth of the obelisk itself. And that was reinforced with the security walls. And the idea of thinking of this as a topographic solution that flows down from the monument over Independence Avenue and on down to the Tidal Basin. The second framework is really about the planting. Uh, obviously, the, the very strong, iconic character of the, the boss and alleys of elms, the more random plantings around Constitution Gardens and south of the Reflecting Pool, and then finally, the markers of cherries that accent both the Tidal Basin and the monument itself. And our site is really the interstitial connector between these two landscapes. And so the idea is starting from the ground up, we looked at this as a single integrated landscape. So even if we didn't get to the roads being changed, the idea is to build this landscape as a single element so the roads would disappear until we could actually disappear them. Um, and so this becomes more of an integrated space. Uh, we also looked at introducing a conservation element, reducing the amount of turf to be maintained. In this case, we've reduced it overall by about 60 percent 
concentrating it where it should be at the amphitheater and also along the tidal basin and then creating a very strong uh, spatial structure with the trees that would again connect the two sides of the monument grounds and grow up and essentially create the frame for the Sylvan Theater using the grove of trees as that framework. This would hopefully create uh, a much more uh, wonderful habitat for uh, urban species including people and using this as really a, a starting point for a whole series of um, activities and flexible uses that can, that can occur year round. Now we had no illusions that a big giant project like this would be done all at once so we looked at the potential for phasing it and components within that the idea is that the first, first stage here uh, which is the site could go first potentially with the amphitheater and the the visitor facility, the reorientation of the roads could occur second and then third could be the bridge and the larger plantings or components thereof. I mean this is these are realities and we wanted to approach them and, and give options for that. What you're looking at here on the top is the the launch point for the bridge. You're essentially about right here and so you're looking back towards the the monument grounds here or over to the tidal basin here. And at the end of the day this is really a space that needs to function without an, uh, uh, performance. It's, while it's built around a stage, uh, it must be a, a beautiful destination and a wonderful environment for, for families, for individuals, both for orientation to the mall but also a destination for comfort and respite. Again, as I mentioned before, the idea is that we see this as both a structured and, a, and unstructured area uh, for activities that could occur year-round. And again, as I mentioned before, the idea of here in Bryant Park, the, the idea of resilience incredibly heavy use and the idea of as a high performance landscape as Marion mentioned these these ideas will need to be um, incorporated into the design as we go forward. Also on the grounds are repurposing of some of the buildings Monument Lodge and Survey Lodge. We see there's wonderful potential to create this as an outdoor uh, uh, a community outreach and volunteer headquarters which would really bring new life to what's currently a wonderful but somewhat underutilized section uh, of the Monument grounds. And from here, uh, again, you can see the idea of the conservation landscape coming up, creating this wonderful, very active and dynamic space that refers back to the monument. So as we start to think about what this wonderful space might be, we have to think about what it means to arrive at this space. And so one question would be, could there be something that's transformative about the arrival of those tour buses from Independence Avenue? And our thought was that the elevation of the back of the amphitheater really becomes a gateway. So services, uh, orientation, exhibition, restrooms are welcoming. And that the back side, if you will, of the Sylvan Pavilion is also framing uh, with our rain gardens an arrival point. But the sense of arrival, the sense of respite, the sense of knowing where you are at any given time on a mall is, is a challenging thing, particularly when it's raining or too hot. Where would you go? Where would you take a break? So the Sylvan Pavilion, if you will, is an inhabitable element of topography, keeping its profile low uh, to complement the, the topography that is the base of the Washington Monument. And this really is a gateway that marks uh, your arrival here. From this Sylvan Pavilion in the amphitheater, there's the section that allows uh, the kind of theater to start to engage both inside and outside, a small intimate performance. And that kind of intimacy of performance could even occur in the winter or the summer, but that identity of the cafe comes from the Sylvan Grove. So that coming through the roof, this is a grove-like environment where uh, the respite for performance is in full complement for the new Sylvan Horizon. And this is starting to show the idea of its arena-like uh, performance, so that the hill that forms the base of the Washington Monument is also invoked for theater. And it's one that's completely expandable. So if 100 feel comfortable near the cafe, 1,000 to 10,000 could feel comfortable here. A playbill could be a, a whole range of events. And so finally, what we think is that the site here is magical and that the Sylvan Grove could be a place of magic and that it's a place of magic <laughs> that we hope with the animation that follows you could even hear the magic that we envision. So we have a sprinter here who's going to start the magic. <laughs>
soundtrack was a little bit misaligned with the images that you were looking at. Well, the at. soundtrack <laughs> the soundtrack won. We finally had a, an erase. The soundtrack won. <laughs> Aretha Franklin, I think, is right around now. Yes. <laughs> Marion, you should sing that. <laughs> of time, I'll save my question for after, and we'll move right on to the final site, Union Square. Uh, Rodrigo Abela and with Gustafson Guthrie Nichols and Peter Cook with Davis Brody Bond. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Rodrigo Abela. I'm Peter Cook. Uh, thank you very much on behalf of uh, GGN and DBB, we are extraordinarily proud and happy to be here and happy that you're here with us. Um, I'm going to uh, start tonight with just a, a little bit of a personal um, anecdote. It was just over uh, the Memorial Day weekend. I had an old buddy of mine um, over the house and he offered his congratulations and I said, thank you very much. And he said, I can see you guys are really busy already. And I said, we are? And he said, he said, yeah, all that stuff you've got going on right in front of Union Station. And I said, hmm, <laughs> you mean all the, 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 the work you know, going on in Columbus Circle? And he said, oh, that's not where you are? And that's when I realized once again that Houston, we have an identi uh, identity problem here. So, and it occurred to me that, you know, I could have told him to meet me at the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, and he'd know exactly where to meet me. We could meet at the base of the Washington Monument. He'd know exactly where to meet me. We could meet at the Jefferson Memorial. We could meet, uh, you know, frankly, even the MLK Memorial now. We could meet at the fountain in DuPont Circle. He'd know exactly. But I'll tell you, if I told him, meet me at the steps at the Grant Memorial in Union Square, he'd have no idea uh, where to meet me. So I think it behooves us to take a little time and I talk about the site and wh where, it, where it actually is. Thank you, Rodrigo. Um, down at the bottom of this, uh, you'll see here uh, the large red rectangle. Uh, and so the site is bound by uh, Constitution uh, to the north, uh, Independence uh, to the south, First Street to the east, and Third Street uh, to the west. And right in the middle, of course, is this fan-shaped uh, uh, water feature. And I suppose I could take a, a poll to figure out you know, how big this, this water feature is. It is six acres, just the water feature that you see there. So you'll get a sense about the overall size and scale of this. The overall site is about 1,500 feet uh, in length. And it takes maybe a leisurely walk. Might, might actually take you about five minutes to walk from end to end. Um, all told, it's about, what do we say, about 25, 27 acres in that red rect rectangle. But you'll see here that, that it is uh, anchored at the edge by the uh, Botanic Garden. Um, it has uh, Pennsylvania Avenue that runs right through it. Notice that Pennsylvania Avenue, one of the grandest avenues in, in, in all of America, if not the entire world, ends in a parking lot. We have Maryland Avenue that cuts right through it as well. And of course, we also have a highway that runs directly underneath it. Quite a complex site. Now, this site also has a very complex history. It's been evolving for 200 years since you know, the, the very beginning when L'Enfant planned the city. And you can see uh, in this sort of clip of L'Enfant's plan I mean. that he actually envisioned for more or less what's our site a grand public space. Uh, he even had a fountain. Uh, the fountain was fed by natural springs. I mean, he really had this idea of a public space in front of the people's house. Now, as L'Enfant's plan got implemented uh, over the years, the, both the mall and the site itself as an open space weren't really uh, picked up. In fact, our site became the home for the Botanic Garden. 
And you can see, uh, actually, this is a pretty amazing picture of the mall. Uh, there's the capital in the distance, uh, Smithsonian Castles around here. And, you know, th there is no mall, there is no space, uh, which is one of the defining characters of Enfant's plan, this grand public space. Uh, and so it wasn't until about 100 years later with the Macmillan Commission that um, there was a, a drive to reassert some of L'Enfant's original vision, uh, in particular the space of the mall. And as part of that uh, renewed vision, you can see the public space, a place for people, came back in the same place. Uh, they even brought back the fountain uh, in a slightly different form. And uh, this plan had an impact. Over time, the mall did start to emerge. It was clear that central access we all know now uh, slowly started to emerge. But by the 1930s, it seems like it ran out of steam or somehow the, the sense the monumental got lost and our site simply became an extension of the mall. Um, the botanic garden is still there. It's on the south. It's um, been sort of moved out of the way. And at least there's a connection between the Capitol and uh, what will be the Washington Monument. But the whole sense of a public space in front of the Capitol is lost. Now, in the 1960s, you know, we're about 150 years, 160 years beyond L'Enfant, uh, SLM develops a new plan uh, with Kylie, part of the Constitution Garden uh, is, is part of the result. And for our site, they propose a monumental reflecting pool, uh, which is what's there now. Uh, and, and so you can see the site sort of, uh, was seesawing between grand visions and sort of more intimate spaces and back to grand visions. And right now it's sort of gone to the grand vision uh, side. And, and, and so the, the existing design, you know, I think works in a sense as intended. It works at this grand, uh, majestic scale. Um, it serves as a wonderful visual forecourt uh, to, the, to the U.S. Capitol building. A lot of people stand in front and get their photos taken there. But it really serves only that purpose, we think. Um, it really only works at that scale. And so this is a little bit hard to see, but this is an aerial view of the uh, inauguration of President Obama in 2008. Um, the real takeaway from this slide is not so much where the people are, and you can kind of see clusters off to your left and so on, um, but really where they aren't. Again, we've talked about six acre uh, water feature right in the middle, which really serves not to really unite people, but to really kind of push people away. It serves as a barrier. And so what you begin to see here, uh, especially in the, in the bottom image, is this is a photo taken roughly from where the Grant Memorial is, looking back at the mall. And we've all probably walked along the north edge of the, the mall. And you can see it pretty much stops there. So again, you can see how this is really a, a very unwelcoming approach to the, uh, to the Capitol. Um, and again, taking a view from the other side, looking back towards it, again, you can see how this thing, uh, the, the pathway stops and really pre uh, is a very unwelcoming approach said, to, the, uh, to the U.S. Capitol. And so what we have really is a underwhelming site, underpopulated site. But yet, it's still a focal point and a very unique plan in the monumental core of Washington. And it, it is the setting for some of our nation's most powerful collective memories. So it's a really powerful site uh, that has not lived up to its uh, potential. And so we think that by integrating the site better into the mall, into the city, and embracing its role as a place for everyday public interactions, we can make a much more successful public space. So with that framework, we approach the site and um, try to figure out what's the right thing to do here uh, today in 2012. And it really starts with looking at the role of the site in the bigger composition of the mall. There's like a very clear hierarchy. We have Lincoln, the Washington Monument, and the Capitol. And we don't need a fourth thing uh, sort of clearing this, uh, messing up this clarity. Our site really is part of the connecting line that links these monuments together. Um, and even though it is part of this extension of the line, it's also the terminus to a great access. So a public plaza, as originally envisioned and re-envisioned, uh, still seems to be the appropriate role. And so our scheme takes the full uh, square and breaks it into three parts. We have a monumental center where we've taken uh, kept the grandeur of the fountain because the scale works with the monumentality of the space but we've turned it 90 degrees 
and engaged it with the mall and strengthened the connection from the mall to the capital, which is what this should be about. It should be about connecting. And then we framed that central core with two National Gardens, which you can really sort of imagine as extensions of the museum rows on either side. Think of them as outdoor museums. We already have one that exists. It's the Botanic Garden, which we've made a little bit bigger. And then on the north side, we're proposing uh, a new garden, which we call the Ground for Emerging Voices. And we don't have time tonight to go into it, but uh, we can talk about it if you have questions. And together, those three pieces are, are, are knitted through walkways and pathways that connect directly um, back to the mall, up to the Capitol, and really importantly, up to Union Station. Uh, and through the Senate parks because uh, the Capitol grounds themselves have grown to the north and there is this important connection to that a very important arrival point in the city, Union Station. So we tried to, um, to introduce multiple scales. You can see on your left is the existing, on the right is proposed. Um, trying to provide, uh, you know, said multiple scales, trying to take this rather um, amorphous uh, space and try to provide for a greater definition, as we'll talk about a little bit. Um, I think if you go to the next one, um, you'll see that we try to retain the monument uh, monumentality of the existing uh, on your left, uh, turn the, uh, the, the, the water feature so it links with the mall and provide a variety of different spaces to the north and to the south, and really turn it into something that invites you in, to draws you into the space, as you can see. And so you, you can see how, um, as, as a forecourt to the Capitol, imagine being on the Washington Monument, going to that vista of the Capitol, and you arrive, and this really draws you in. The water comes out, so now it's visible, and it acts as a, as a draw to bring you in, and it frames Grant in, in a better way. So that, that's sort of the, the overview of the composition, but we want to get into uh, a little bit more of a finer scale uh, because, as Peter mentioned, this is an enormous site, and coming to grips with the scale is a key part of making it work. Uh, and to give you a, a common reference point, here is uh, Martin Luther King at the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Uh, you can see the crowd of people. Here is that plaza at the bottom of the steps without that crowd of people. And here is that plaza next to our plan. Uh, you can see the plaza here in the rectangle. And it fits in one small fraction of our site. Uh, and at the scale of the mall, this site needs that space to accommodate all the uses um, that happen on the mall and to take a lot of the pressure off the lawn panels. Uh, so the, the, the requirement for a large public space is good for when you need those big events. But this site lives every day and it has to be able to accommodate the everyday life. And so if we zoom into one of these terraces, what we did is to sort of tame that scale and subdivide the space while still making it work uh, is what I want to describe. The first step, of course, is adding trees, shade, uh, to make the space comfortable. Uh, but the second more important step is we actually graded those terraces on either side of the main fountain and graded them up about three feet so they frame the central space. But they also uh, do two things. One, with the terraces, you subdivide a large space into smaller spaces. And second, on the north side uh, over here, you can see there's a wall. And that wall separates the center from the sides and uh, allows more intense programming on the sides and protects that programming from the masses of people that come through. And so you allow within these terraces a space that can be part of the larger central space, but within it exist more intimate spaces and the opportunity for uh, sort of these sort of everyday things uh, when you're not using it for the big event. And like I said, those walls on either side then allow these gardens to exist and to be more intensely planted and not suffer the abuse that you know, thousands of tourists uh, moving through uh, cause. And at the same time, that more intense programming brings activity to the site and populates the site and makes it a vital part of everyday Washington. And within the fountain itself, we also try to uh, tame the scale. Yes, it works at a monumental scale, but it also uh, has different scales. So the first step is we introduce actually three types of water. We have the main water, which is reflecting water. And then we have a north-south axis that connects the Botanic Garden to the ground of emerging voices. And that's cascading water. And with water, one of the, the things that never comes through in images is the sound. So the movement of that water helps to fill the space and make it less void-like. 
And then lastly, we have jets. And we've introduced uh, jets not as a constant thing, but as something that can happen, say, on the weekends or for special events, uh, so that there's always a reason to come back and the space seems different. And finally, the, the central pool itself is divided into five panels uh, with pathways across it. Actually, my daughter uh, told me, remember, tell them you can walk on water, uh, which is effectively what happens as you, you're allowed to walk through this fountain instead of having to walk all the way around it. Uh, but more importantly, those panels then can be used to program the space in different ways. So in an everyday, everyday scenario, you can imagine those terraces may host a group of tourists and uh, a guide orienting them to what they're about to see or what they've just come uh, from a visit of the capital. One of those panels could be turned off. The water is only two inches deep, so it drains quickly. It's much more sustainable than what's there now. And it allows flexibility. So one panel could be turned off and you have a small stage for maybe a slightly larger event. Or perhaps you actually turn off the panel in front of Grant for a more, uh, for a grander event, but maybe uh, one that still has some water so people who aren't part of the event can still enjoy the space. Or you actually put the stage in the center and create a stage in the round for the kinds of festivals that happen, say, around the cherry blossom time. And of course, you can set it up so you can take advantage of the entire length of the mall for those big national events that are such a key part of the symbolism of the site. So what we've tried to do is um, to create a space that, that unifies. And a space that welcomes expression. A space that offers a diversity of expression. And a space that encourages discovery and wonder. And then finally, a space that stirs the imagination. Thank you very much. I might now uh, ask you to uh, hold up your cards if you've got questions, and we'll begin collecting those. Uh, meanwhile, do you mind if I stand instead of sitting down? Um, I might start the questioning. Um, I might start by asking uh, Rodrigo and Peter the sort of sustainability question. Um, you are d you're replacing an enormous water feature with another water feature. Uh, where does the water come from? How does the volume of water compare to what's there now? Is it more sustainable, less sustainable? There's a 40-page appendix that was part of the competition. <laughs> gets into, there, there's a, in, uh, a very comprehensive uh, water plan that we worked out with uh, one of our uh, team members, a civil engineer. Um, and what we discovered is first, by reducing the depth of the water to two inches, uh, we, I think, changed the volume by something like 90%. So the volume... By how much? And currently it's, it's like 90%. Uh -huh. It's greatly reduced. Currently the water about is about 18, 18 inches 18 deep. Inches deep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then second, we introduced a reservoir. So when we drain that water, we actually hold it and can recycle it and bring it back when we need it. So we're not... Right now, if they drain the fountain, they throw that water away. And then third, the makeup water is, uh, we worked out that actually just using the groundwater that is um, being uh, pumped out because of the tunnel, the highway tunnel below, we have enough volume to make up the groundwater uh, plus uh, harvesting rain. Right. And I might point out that this is also a, a part of the proposal for the Constitution Garden site, as, as you talked about, that involves collecting water from the neighboring buildings and, and uh, using it on site. Um, and then I might ask um, Marion and Skip, y you talked a lot about your design as a, as a performance landscape, and most evidently it's a performance space, it's a theater, but you talked about high performance and used performance in other ways. What, what are the other meanings of performance that you are addressing or alluding to? I think we might share this because mm -hmm. there's uh, w the performance is both uh, literal in the terms that we think about performance in theater, but the performance has to do with allowing this landscape to be a high performance place. So it's a place that's there for 24 hours a day, live at night in magical ways you might not imagine, but a sylvan grove or a canopy of shade that's a welcoming place for people who are on the mall so that there's a a place of performance there and a way of engaging it that we can't at this point think of it as a, a, as a place of performance. And it's performance as a connection as well between two different landscapes of the Tidal Basin and the Mall. So performance actually has some philosophical turns in our thinking. And I would just add too that I think one of the most important things about high performance is the ability to use it in multiple ways at the same time. One of the most critical things that we were asked to do was 
provide a performance venue or a destination without interfering with the great number of crowds and circulation that was already going on, be it bus, pedestrian, bicycle, and so forth. So the idea is that from the very beginning it was meant to be a standalone element that worked within the flow of everything that was going on around it. I think the building and the site are, are so, I mean the architecture and the landscape are so integrated that in terms of sustainable performance there's a lot of, obviously a lot of um, uh, you know, green roof potential, insulation potential, stormwater collection potential, which not to the scale of the other sites, but is definitely there because where the theater sits now is actually uh, the beginning of a natural drainage way that led to the tidal basin. So we have to be very careful about, you know, thinking of the soils that we're using there and potentially taking advantage of that natural grade to capture more than we might ordinarily. Um, but I think in some ways the social performance is also as critical, just given the visitor volume the chance to orient you, provide a comfortable place that mitigates the climate, uh, and provides a, a wide range of activities. So when you talk about performance, you're not only talking about uh, the, the obvious performance, you're talking about the way the landscape functions in terms of circulation and, and stormwater management and so forth. I, is that kind of performance also a, a consideration for you in designing, redesigning Constitution Gardens? Definitely, because right now, what we understand both from being there but also from talking to representatives from the Park Service uh, is that it is a drain on resources without being able to get it up to uh, a level of presentation and of use and it doesn't really work for the area. The lake is a good example of this where it um, it silts up and uh, algae clogs it. it has to be drained and reused and part of this is the fact that it's just a reflecting lake, you know, with a concrete bottom and a shallow uh, pool. And so what we were trying to do was connect all of these parts and all of these systems uh, so that hopefully at the end the landscape works for the area, works for the community, uh, works for the environment, um, but also the visitors, uh, in addition to being something of a, of a preserved uh, modern design. Mm -hmm. Well, let me push back a little bit on the performance question, um, because in looking at the proposals, um, they're all beautifully designed and quite carefully thought out in terms of soil composition and plant material and so forth. So you're obviously thinking a lot about how they would perform. Um, but this is a space that's, as you say, visited by 24 million people a year, that, is, uh, that the Park Service can barely manage to uh, maintain the, gr the turf layer. Uh, and you're talking about in in fairly intensively planted areas. I mean, in at Union Square, you'd have both the sort of emerging voices area and the botanical gardens, which where the plantings would be enhanced. The plantings would be enhanced both around the Sylvan Theater and across Independence Avenue. You were even talking about a nursery, I think. Uh, and you, you talked about a sort of upland planting and slope plantings and so forth. So how do you reconcile that degree of sort of uh, botanical interest and, and horticulture, horticultural variety with the demands of this uh, incredibly heavily used space? Will they really, would they really perform is the bottom line. I mean, one of the, one of the real factors is right now when we show that image of the mall being loved to death, it's clear that that lawn is being used as a walking surface, yeah. a, a high use surface. One of the introductions that I think all the schemes share is that there's hardscape introduced in certain dedicated areas where high traffic is encouraged. And so that gives the, the plantings a more robust chance of thriving. And so the choreography and relationship of hard and soft uh, and botanical interest, if you will, and, and paved intensity starts to balance and, and actually set up a, a, a potential that's not there right now. Yeah, I think you, you, give, um, you give people clear uh, cues about where they should move through and where they shouldn't. You know, and I went into a little detail on ours, how we physically separate those. But we also have experience in, in Chicago. We did a botanic garden as part of Grand Park that is at the foot of a amphitheater performance space where we have 10,000 people trying to get to a parking garage right through our garden. And by appropriately sizing paths so you encourage crowds to go in one direction and individuals to go into the garden, you can actually protect these things and make them live side by side. Mm -hmm. and, and part of what influenced you know, our, our approach to the design was, as Rodrigo said, we've got a what is it, about two inch depth of, of water there, so it can be easily drained. So I kept talking about how we've got what's six acres of, of, of water currently right there. 
So imagine the types of events that can be relocated that are currently on the mall, on the green spaces of the mall, that can be relocated onto Union Square mm -hmm. just by removing two inches of water. And so I think that speaks to the fact that mm -hmm. the, all three of these sites are part of a larger master plan vision for how to manage the entire mall and its population. Well, I think, John, that just to jump on the idea of manage, because I think one of the things that we don't have not often heard, uh, at least in terms of the mall, you know, which often is dealt with on a yearly budget cycle, is is there a longer term operations and maintenance strategy that while initially may be more intensive in its installation, actually saves money or saves effort and that was one of the ideas behind thinking about the conservation area. Is there a longer term return uh, that helps the Park Service focus where they need to and maybe not focus as intensely all the time on other areas? And I think complexity may be easier to manage overall, but not the common practice today. So mm -hmm. you may think of lawn areas uh, as being the easiest to maintain because people have been doing that for years, you know, here. But one thing specifically at Constitution Gardens that we heard about was the initial interplanting of bulbs and lawn um, and then trees being separate. And the idea of mixing bulbs and lawn was very difficult because the regular mowing and maintenance that needs to go on would not be possible at the times when, when those were flowering or dying down. And so I think the complexity that we're describing uh, or th that I'm describing is something that we really want to work with the Park Service and the future maintenance to try and coordinate the abilities that they have with horticultural comp compositions and systems that um, will work, you know, in a symbiotic sort of way. So reducing lawn, using the elements, benches, uh, as well as water and, and plantings of different kinds to make more clearly defined areas. So the people stay in the spaces where people should be and they clearly don't go in the places that are right. too steep. At, at the same time though, we know that um, the, the, uh, the sort of unexpected and even sometimes oppositional uses of public space will always happen. So you can't anticipate everything. Um, can you, uh, how flexible are these designs in terms of accommodating uh, s sorts of unexpected uses or, or uses that might emerge in the next generation? There's a, a couple things. One is the, Marion spoke to it briefly and I think it shows up in all of them, is trying to make the clear control of how and where spaces are used in different ways. One little thing we didn't point out given the brevity of the presentation, but we've actually added a, a 30 inch high wall along the Constitution Avenue side, which enables the, the increase of the grade, but it also lets those entry points become focused and controlled both for pedestrians and for the sake of the experience itself. And, you know, we didn't point out either, but one of the big things about both flexibility and control is, and I think this is in Sylvan Gardens as well, you know, part of the role of the buildings that are brought here is not just to provide services, but actually to produce revenues that have to do with the capacity of maintaining the spaces um, and maintaining the programmatic actions that go on. I think also uh, to answer your question about long-term flexibility, you know, all these schemes um, likely are phase type schemes and, you know, these, these are visions that can guide development uh, for these areas over 20 years. They're not things that are going to be built in one shot and so within, within that broader vision you can adjust as you learn or as new uses come through. Uh, you know, I think that's certainly part of Mm -hmm. um, as an avowed partisan of, of landscape design, let me ask the um, landscape and or architecture question. Um, two of these projects involve a, a, a very high designed architectural element. Uh, and I believe you didn't talk about it, but there is a, an architectural piece to your proposal to uh, the Center for Emerging uh, Talents. So um, are, we, are we adding sort of conspicuous new buildings to the mall? Um, do the buildings uh, become the psych sort of iconic representation of the mall? Or do you see the architecture and the landscape remaining in balance and the mall remaining primarily a landscape experience? I think um, ours might have conspicuous 
monument within eyesight. Uh, mm -hmm. And so the relationship between architecture and the landscape had to really be in full support of the terrain that it's a part of. And in that regard, it's submitting to a larger landscape and the architecture is uh, amplifying that identity and the there there of it, but very much um, uh, holding its respect to the larger monumental landscape. It's a little different in Constitution Gardens. I think we, um, when I introduced the pavilion, I've used the term like try and find just enough building to go in there because it's it's got a lot of programmatic activities that need to take place and be supported. And when we look back at the original SOM plan, they actually had a very, very modest pavilion that was I'd, almost apologetic. And we felt that that was actually not the right thing to do either. That you really needed to be clear of your time. In this case, let the s most of the services be buried, but the shell of the pavilion uh, take, its, take a very quiet and humble place. It's within the canopy of the trees all around the garden. So it really exists within Constitution Gardens, not in, as part of the bigger scheme of a building or monument on the mall. And I think its its hollowness is very intentional, and its low horizontality and proportion. Um, during the jury session, we had a, a nice back and forth conversation with Tom Main, who was one of the jurors, who said, you know, he he felt like it was the essence of the modern solution to be the very simple, delicate, empty horizontal against the pure mass vertical of the. Uh, monument beyond and I think that we appreciated that because that was very much the intent of how do you how do you build on the mall unapologetically but humbly I think that, that this will give a slight presence on the street but it doesn't engage in the rest of the mall landscape on the other hand when you're inside Constitution Gardens as Rob described it's something that sort of orbits with you because we're moving around these curving paths it doesn't have a static relationship to the uh, to the monument or to the other things and it sits within the tree line so this is something that helps as a looking glass but also in a way dematerializes from inside. The, the, the building was not part of our program um, and but we, we did a lot of uh, research looked at some earlier uh, mappings and saw of course the Macmillan plan which <coughs> actually shows a building in that spot which is essentially a mirror image of what you currently have there at the Botanic Garden. Mm -hmm. um, we thought that a building of some size, of some program, would, would help support some of the things we're trying to do at the um, Emerging Voices. Um, so it was just a conceptual idea of having, having something to be able to support that. We looked at a variety of different locations for it. And of course, probably the first one, the default one, was to look at what the Macmillan Plan taught us. Um, when you actually get down into the weeds of, of looking at the site, it turns out that, that it looks very symmetrical, but it's actually not. There's lots of little idiosyncrasies. So we kind of said, well, let's explore other ideas other than simply just a mirror image of the Botanic Garden. We looked at actually some sort of a berm type of structure, um, and I think we came to the conclusion, let's explore other options. Um, you already have a hill, right? right. <laughs> a hill. I'm not going to compete with that. And then there's one slide which we, which we didn't show tonight, but uh, uh, for those of you who want a homework assignment, go back and look at uh, uh, Louisiana <laughs> Avenue um, and Pennsylvania Avenue. And you'll see that there is a very strong built edge on the north side of Pennsylvania Avenue and on the what? west side of Louisiana. Conversely, it is less part of an edge, shall we say, on, those, on the other sides. So the pavilion, the structure that we're showing uh, in, in our project, um, completes that, that triangle, that built edge. So anyway. Of course, for, for our site, the real dominant building is the capital. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and the interesting thing that happens is that because of the new security measures that were implemented after 9-11, you can't have a public space anywhere near the capital. And this site is actually just far enough away but still has that very clear relationship to the capital that it can become the public plaza in front of the capital uh, very effectively and give back that voice to the people that is sort of lost.
Rodrigo, you bring up security considerations. Are, were they a factor in each of the designs? The external work for us, we, we met with the Arc the Capital and they gave us some criteria to work with, uh, but certainly it was seen as a, as a secondary layer of security to what is already the primary layer of security. And of course the Washington Monument's already been redesigned from a security perspective. It, it, did those? A lot of what we started with was really basically keeping intact what was already there. Um, the, there was clear circulation and the functionality of the walls was maintained. Um, but the interesting thing about the building within the landform is it offers a lot of opportunities for future um, incorporation of security, uh, if that's necessary, depending on the development of the program. No. I might turn now to the questions from the audience. Um, if these projects were really built, history tells us that 20%, 50%, or even 80% will eventually get redesigned by yet another generation of designers. Uh, so what are the markers or, or, uh, of this era or the forms and features of these designs that you most want to see survive? I mean, if only a piece of your work were to survive, what piece would it be? We, we, I don't think we should wow. VE these projects yet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Anybody else want to feel that That was one? an excellent answer. <laughs> Okay, um, let's talk about the economics of these landscapes then. Um, I mean, we have incredible challenges maintaining these landscapes uh, as they are now. Um, do your projects represent a, a sort of opportunity to um, make maintenance less expensive, or are there ways in which uh, sort of income generation is built into these projects? I mean, resilience, if you will, uh, of the economics, I think, is at, at heart in all of these schemes. And in, in all cases, the idea of these sites actually pulling less resources, uh, whether it's water, whether it's mowing, whether it's uh, things that are high maintenance into focus is one thing. But I think in other cases, certainly, our two sites have venues that will be producing revenue. And the idea then of these things being able to be more self-sustaining is really at hand as yeah. well. One thing is hard to see because there's only six of us up here, but each one of these are, are actually really deep teams of, of, from engineering specialists to everything. And for instance, on our team, Dan Biederman, who runs you know, programming and operations at Bryant Park, and we have in our 40-page you know, technical submission lists of a lot of kinds of programs, some revenue producing, uh, other ways to use the spaces in the way that contemporary parks and public spaces are being used around the country. And I think the mall is, is beginning to, to embrace and, and understand some of the ways that it can be used, not just used physically all the time, but for a variety of functions. I would just add too on ours, we absolutely considered it in terms of planting and operations and maintenance, but we also looked at it uh, potentially as an idea of, of partnerships either with outside organizations or volunteer organizations. I mean, most large public parks now always have some sort of conservancy or volunteer uh, system that really takes some of the load off and in terms of both theater, maybe the concession, uh, are there partnerships that could happen that could, again, either generate revenue or actually take lift some of the burden in a way that might be a creative uh, change from some of the ways that, that things are done now. So it was, you know, it was going beyond just the physical components of the design into potentially the operations and, and larger extension of um, partnering opportunities. And I think that was something that was exciting to us about the trust sponsoring this competition mm -hmm. and being the fund and uh, revenue generating uh, part of the design effort and reimagining the, uh, the mall. Um, we're really wondering if there is going to be the potential for these other kind of partnerships uh, related to the Park Service because the National Park Service runs parks and uh, it's, a, it's a question we'd like to get into with everyone as we move forward. Do you want to address this question? You, uh, you or, talked already or, about the savings in terms of the water uh, uh, in I your think for, for us, the are there other because of the location near the capital, um, I, I can imagine revenue generating types of events. You know, they're not going to oh, yeah. uh, rent us out to weddings, for example, right? Uh, and so I think part of what what happens here is you you invest in in Union Square, 
to provide a venue that can accommodate all the a lot of events that take a lot of the pressure off the mall and take a lot of the maintenance dollars away from those resources uh, then can be, be used somewhere else. So it, it is also an investment. It's not yeah. really about... Uh, let, let me push back on this a little bit too though because um, in the last generation we've seen a kind of erosion of public space as pieces of it are, are leased out to concessioners. Um, I have a friend who rages about Danny Meyer's Shake Shack in um, Madison Square because it used to be a, a wonderful public space and now it's a private money-making venture. So is, is that the road we're going down uh, here on the, on the mall? Is this, are there going to be, are we looking to a future where we see private concessioners all, all up and down the, the sides of the mall? Well, we, I mean, we learned early on that you could not sell t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> it's a delicate balance. You know, on, on the other hand, Madison Square Park is fabulously maintained. They got an unbelievably great public art program. It's, you know, packed with people. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a vibrant, successful public space. Really terrific. Uh, and and it happens to have a hamburger shack in the middle of it. But and the same could be said of the whole west side of, of Manhattan, where there are lots of skateboarding parks or trapeze places, oh. you know, which, all of which make money, all of which bring people to the park. Um, but I, I do think it's a, it's a challenge to all of us to maintain a kind of balance between the need to generate program and the need to generate income for maintenance while at the same time ensuring that these spaces are as public as they have historically been. But I think it's not a, a thing of you're out there trying to make piles of money by using the public space. You know, when you're talking about concessions for skate rental, for uh, boat rental, you know, we got a hot dog stand in the lower level. Those things are, are actually services as much as they are revenue producing. And that's part of a successful public space, is engaging uh, broad constituencies in a variety of activities, you know, and there's a modest income, income stream as part of that, which goes back to serve the park space. But I also mm -hmm. think this is, this is not just, you know, a public space in some city somewhere. This, this, uh, is a very significant public space. It's, it is a national stage and, and to have that size of a space to accommodate you know, those national events and those voices and give those voices a venue to be heard is I think something you need to invest in and it's, it's valuable for the country as a whole. And is there a, you know, is there a benefit in terms of by f allowing people that are experts at doing this to focus on what they do, does it allow the park service, rather than to have to spread itself completely all over the place, to do what its mission is and what it does best? You know, which is basically you know preservation interpretation. You know, be the ambassador for the national mall to the country. Um, and they don't have to manage the the food service and this and that. You know, just let them do kind of what they want to do, what they need to do. Um. Our next question reminds me of Salieri's comment that uh, Mozart's music had too many notes. Um, and the question is, are we creating too many centers, too many places, too many notes on the mall? It's an interesting question and you know, certainly that question has been asked about the uh, growth in the count of monuments and memorials on the mall. Um, but you can see though in some ways this is an extraordinary landscape that people could count on as well and it needs places of respite and there's this very odd thing of having the wonderful Smithsonian buildings you have to go into a building and back out of a building or you go to one monument after another not shielded from the sun or from the rain so to be able to complement these incredible destinations and the extraordinary landscape I think has been the core aspiration of the National Mall plan and of the trust for the National Mall to really enhance and actually allow these things to thrive. So it's not so much too much or too little, it's what kind of introductions are brought to, to bear. It's also about maintaining a proper sense of hierarchy. Um, maintaining? A proper sense of hierarchy mm -hmm. and, and not losing that balance. Uh, you know, for example, just even when you're trying to you know, do lighting on the mall, there's a very clear guidelines, you know, Washington Monument, Capitol. Great segue. We have a question about lighting. Um, <laughs> and I, I'd be interested both uh, to hear about the, the
kind or the quality of lighting and also the, the uh, sort of expense involved, uh, again, the sort of s energy consumption sustainability question. <laughs> we happen to have our night image up, right? <laughs> so, you know, I think cities suffer from way too much ambient light and one of the, you know, the, the mall, one of the disadvantages of the mall is it's so separate from the rest of sort of the vibrant urban center of BC, but one of the advantages is that at night it can actually, its relative darkness can be a, a very pleasant experience. And by keeping light levels low and allowing intimacy to happen at night, you create, you transform the space. Uh, and we certainly, with our bevy of consultants, uh, you know, worked on low level, uh, LED sort of replacement lights to, to achieve what we need to do and some renew ideas for renewable energy to power those lights and, and that sort of thing. But I think generally I think the intimacy of low level lighting in the mall is something we could celebrate. And, and our goal with the lighting was to, to create a space that feels connected to the design through the lighting design even though we also understand that we will be required to use the light fixture that's used on the rest of the mall. And so to do that, where, where in other places it's relating to older buildings and older landscapes of different styles and then bring it into a 70s, 60s, 70s modernist uh, design um, is something that we thought of as a, as a design challenge um, that can be resolved. Um, also, relamping it, we hope, uh, the goal is to use LED lamps within that fixture. Um, last question from the audience involves the existing plant material. Um, Adam and Rob, you talked about uh, lifting and moving existing trees, including some very big trees. Are, is there existing plant material on either the other sites that uh, can be that has to be moved or can be saved? We actually have trees that date back to the original botanic garden and mm -hmm. the plant is very careful in where it uh, sort of preserves those trees, uh, both uh, near 3rd Street uh, flanking the central uh, axis and around Grant. So we, we have worked very hard to maintain the, the existing historic plantings. Mm -hmm. And at Sylvan I Theater? I think our, our framework was, uh, editing was very subtle. I mean we were, we had the luxury of physical intervention was occurring where there is not much planting to begin with. This really, there's somewhat of this frame behind the, sil the existing Sylvan Theater. One of the things we felt very strongly about was over near Survey Lodge, there's actually some wonderful trees that are actually in some of the best shape on the mall, and it's a very popular picnic ground. And so while we were working to uh, integrate service and uh, interconnection to the Survey Lodge, we were very, very careful to maintain as many of those trees as possible. I think I am. I'll get feedback. Sorry. Um, and so, keeping that as uh, close to the existing as possible while integrating the new service requirements there, uh, and then below uh, Independence Avenue is really just simply amplifying what's already there in terms of uh, reinforcing the existing planning and actually bringing it across. So, we were, I think, in a fortunate position to be more adding more than we were editing in this case. Um. I might uh, bring this slowly to a close by asking you if you have questions you'd like to ask each other. Wow. <laughs> wow. Don't be shy. Um. I think a question I'd like to ask the others was, did they have the same sense of terror and wonder and fear and excitement that we did in approaching this incredible landscape? I, you know, I think we, we uh, alluded to the fact that, that I think we're still, uh, maybe I'll speak for you, yeah. still trying to grasp how large this space is. I mean, I, I started out talking about how to walk from independence to constitution, you know, roughly five minutes, five minutes across this site. Yeah. So it's still an issue about scale and, and how you can be able to break down that scale. Right now, it's just one big scale. So how do you then break down that scale to something that's more human scale? But for me, for me, there was a, a great early moment to, because I had the advantage of being able to walk across the site with, with Pete Walker, um, who's been thinking about the mall for a long, long time. And, you know, when we got into Constitution Gardens, it, it was very comforting him to, for him to really look around and, and say, you know, this really isn't bad, but <laughs> 
it's just not right. And and that that began to frame all of our conversations about okay, what how how do we make it right? What is what are the right steps to to take this thing forward and and act with the deep respect that you need on the mall, yet make what in in some ways I, I know when when we were talking with Pete, he kept saying, I don't think people really understand how radical our scheme is in terms of the topography. And and when you get into the grading and the issues of, of the shaping, um, it's actually, despite its apparent subtlety, a, a rather radical notion to do that on the mall. Um, and so it's it's finding that. I don't, I don't know if I had terror right away, but it, that, that came later. <laughs> well, I, I think that terror came when you realized we did mean lift every tree or yeah. <laughs> all of the soil. <laughs> other thoughts, questions for each other? Well, I might oh. um, if, evoke Marion's um, terror then. Um, <laughs> Uh, as a way of con bringing this to a conclusion. Um, I came up the mall this evening to remind myself what's at stake here. And what's at stake is enormous. Uh, and I think terror and awe are appropriate responses to a space that, um, in which is inscribed so much of our nation's history. Uh, it's really the space of democracy. And I'm not old enough maybe to remember Marian Anderson singing on the steps of the uh, Lincoln Memorial because she was denied the opportunity to sing at Constitution Hall. But I am old enough to remember Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, which still gives me chills even thinking about it. Uh, I'm old enough to remember the protests against the Vietnam War and um, Richard Nixon's visit to the mall to meet with the demonstrators. Uh, I'm old enough to remember the bicentennial, uh, the celebrations of the millennium. Um, and I'm young enough to remember Barack Obama's inauguration with two million people <laughs> crowded onto the mall and, and being physically lifted off the mall after the inauguration when the mass of people had to constrict to get past the buildings and you literally were lifted off the ground and your feet spun in the air. Um, so it's an incredible space and one um, uh, that, that should trigger terror and awe. Um, but it's also um, an amazing space. It's, um, we're, we're, what's also at stake here is, I think, the future of one of the most carefully curated spaces in America. And some of our most creative minds have left their mark on the mall, from L'Enfant to Andrew Jackson Downing to the Macmillan Commission, Frederick Law Olmsted, Daniel Chester French, uh, and more recently, Maya Lin and, and Lawrence Halperin. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's a space of democracy, it's also a space of incredible creativity. And uh, I think we've seen tonight that uh, there are still ways to make it better. There are still ways that s the most creative minds of our generation uh, can also leave their imprint on them all. And I want to express my admiration to the panelists to their teams who aren't here, but also to the, all the other teams that competed in the competition because I thought the level of submissions was amazingly high uh, and clearly uh, people rose to the challenge of, tr of trying to reimagine what is one of the premier spaces in the nation and indeed the world. So um, I might ask, uh, conclude by asking um, our panel to give thanks to the audience for their attention and for their excellent questions. Way to go, audience. And I'd like our audience uh, to thank the panelists for their incredible presentations and for thinking so well on your feet <laughs> or on your seats. And I want to ask all of us to thank uh, the, building commission, the Building Museum, uh, the NCPC, uh, and the Trust for the National Mall for their efforts in bringing this event together and, the, and uh, for uh, this incredible competition. So thank you very much. <laughs>